Hi, um, I'm just getting set up here. Uh, my name is Jason Johnson. I've um, been a, uh, I'm a member of the uh, OWASP Oklahoma City chapter, and, um, chapter leader. My um, presentation is going to be about the high project that I'm currently working on, and and basically what it is is it's a um, a capable testing system for people to, you know, use for projects and it started out as a learning environment and uh, what what ended up happening is a lot of the um, a lot of the trials that we that I went through didn't succeed. So what what ended up coming to it was is you know, it had a gazillion different services that I wanted to use. There's a ton of different um, OWASP projects out there, and there's a bunch of issues that people wanted to solve. So um, we wanted to connect the hives together because, you know, without, you know, being a hive, you don't really have much of anything but more than just a capable PC that can, you know, run your project on. The other the other aspect was um, security. We wanted it to be a locking inner grid type security that everything could, you know, connect somehow and be really low cost. Um, we wanted the OWASP community to be able to use this. And we wanted to be able to provide a platform that anybody could use, anybody could, you know, open it up, you know, code however they wanted to, put whatever OS they wanted to on these. And, our, and the idea started to stem to like, you know, development boards like the Raspberry Pi, the BeagleBone Black, um, Android, you know, basically any type of computer you could find you wanted to um, make into, you know, a node on, on the high. Um, the, the real goal is to spawn ideas and new projects from a lot. A lot of... Um, uh, projects that are out there right now, you know, you, you can tell that they just they just go dormant after so many you know months or so. Just nobody wants to take them over. And here's kind of a a brief or, or, uh, overview of what what it is now. The picture in the middle is what the the hive in you know a presentation type mode kind of shows what it looks like. It's supposed to look like a beehive, but it's basically to signify that. Um, it's easy to outsource storage of bulk data, and you know you're probably asking, well, why don't we just use like Dropbox or Google Drive or something, the low OWASP, and also your own private hive I mean, or grid? Now I get into that later how that actually works. But what we what was really interesting in this project is there the actual grid will keep your data safe. So you don't have to worry about, you know, you're trying to test and exploit, you're trying to do this, you're trying to do this, different kind of things that would otherwise be construed as like, well, you shouldn't be doing that, and, you know, now it's on Dropbox, and someone's going to get it, you know, things like that. So this is a safe environment for you to test in. It's a safe environment that you set up a storage node, you know where they're going. If you have a friend net, which we'll get into here also, then you'll know where your data is at all times, and you'll know it's secure, and it's immutable and mutable and there's no way that someone's going to get your data and even if they do it's going to take a while for them to you know be able to decrypt and uh, get the uh, actual file from it so with that said this slide I was I was adding more to the last minute but we're currently the hive is running db wheezy on each uh, beagle bone currently we do have versions for Raspberry Pi, and I'll show you that in the demo. There's also different technologies, like it's using a Twisted for the for the Python, for the networking and the actual web server that it runs on the actual Pi, so it's like real low footprint. You don't have to worry about this thing overwhelming. The point of this is, is that you can take your project, put whatever OS you're working on, use a capable PC that costs about $45, you put your project on, and then you have somewhere to interface with storage. So say you you mess something up, you reboot or format your computer and 
all you do is put the link in and it repairs your files for you. You don't have to worry about, you know, going out to the your your uh pins or your, you know, remote drives, your um, USB sticks. You can just go to the grid and get your files back. Even if part of the grid is down, you can still do that. So when we think of file storage, we think, you know, our hard drive, you know, we have our home, you know, which is our root. We have our pictures and all of our files in there. You know, everyone understands the notation of a security perimeter. It's like a wall around. It's an important thing. You rely, you know, upon everything inside. Your security depends upon everything inside the wall behaving as expected. And that doesn't always happen when you're trying to, you know, develop projects and work with things. Nothing performs as expected. Um, so we generally, you know, you care about three things when you think about this kind of approach to storing your stuff in any type of project, whether it be, you know, your personal files or your project files. You want um, confidentiality, of course, integrity, and availability. And uh, confidentiality is knowing that no one else can get your data. Or, you know, even if they can, you want it that's not the right data or they can't understand what they're seeing. So the Hive will provide both of those in a sense. So this is, you know, your local disk is how we see it. Um, this is your local file system in your house. You know, you got your computer, your, you know, your files are here, nowhere else. Then you got your remote file system, you got your Dropboxes, you got your Google Drives, Amazon Cloud, you know, Rackspace, whatever. It's very cheap. And it's uh you know, it's robust. But, you know, they try really hard to uh you know, an upstanding company isn't gonna tell you that how secure they are. But their version of security and our version of security is something completely different. You know, we're we we know that in order for them to keep our data, they're going to have to copy it off someplace. So your data is out there, it's copied, and there's multiple copies of it, who knows where. So um, we're going to go over how the high can provide an environment that will let you fail, you know, this, you know, very in in a very nice way. So you can fail and then come back to where you were without having to worry about, you know, your files being out there in everybody else's hands. So here's kind of a cloud sort of image. You know, this is, you know, people around the world accessing your storage, and this is good. And everybody can get there. The problem is there's really no security. You might be going over, you know, SSL or whatever, but that's great. It's just that, and it can be broke over time. Um, trying to get into your local network is a pain. You know, it, it's hard to figure out all this, you know, crazy ISP stuff. They block things because they don't want you in. You need a business account and all that mess. Um, another thing is that disasters. You know, bad things are always happen. Your computer knocks off the shelf. Something happens, you know, your, your kids decide to use the CD tray as a sandwich slot. But these things tend to happen a lot. Um, it makes you sad. You know, you get correlated failures. My data is here; it's broke. There's no way to get to it. Then you have, you know, remote data decorrelated failures. Your data is over here, and your house is burning down, but I still have my data. Yay! Another um, sample of this is like, like, you know, you have the USB sticks or whatever, and you wash it or whatever, and it just doesn't ever work right or your file is not the same as what you took off of your computer. And, you know, your most important things, you want them to be secret. Like your social security numbers, your bank balances, and your information account and all that. The, um, it's kind of, you know, it, this, this kind of slide's kind of weird in the fact that, you know, you keep your local files secret just because you file on that and, you know, the bad guys can't get in. But there's always a way, you know, there's always a way to get in somehow, some way, to get your data out or to see what you're working on or what you're doing. And then, obviously, over the network, it's a lot harder to keep your data safe. 
there's always prying eyes, there's always people trying to get in and doing something. So then people encrypt. And they use, you know, encryption to encrypt their files and makes it harder for people to get in. Um, you're basically transferring transforming the problem. That you're getting smaller keys, bigger keys, but there's still there's still one significant issue is that when you're uploading your stuff or when you're working on a project or whatever, you are you're uploading your file. Your file is going across the network in some form. That is vulnerable in a sense. You know, you are in plain sight for however long it takes you to complete that transaction. And your integrity, file integrity is big, especially with any kind of any kind of um, you know encryption. You want to make sure that what you're uploading to the cloud is what you get back from the cloud, and everything is going to be same and you know validated that it's going to be what you the most recent version of what you've uploaded, and it's not some you know disaster recovered version that they recovered or some you know Dropbox or something did whatever may happen and why this pertains to the hive is because like I stated before things your things when you're developing your projects and working on things you don't want people having that for whatever reason um, so what this basically is it's going to be a secure robust file system you know, I thought when I was building this, I want to, you know, have a computer that people could share. And I thought, well, well, we'll just share resources. Everybody, you know, if they're not, if their hive not in use, the other hive will be able to use those resources, their CPU, you know, which can be done relatively easy with clustering. But it wasn't, it didn't really seem tangible. I was like, well, that only applies to about maybe 12% of the projects out there in OWASP. So I thought, you know, maybe something even better would be kind of a secured file system on top of being able to share everything across the board, you know, resources from a Beagle Bone. And, the, and when we started this, we started it with a Raspberry Pi. Raspberry Pi is a great tool. It's very cheap, about 25 bucks. You know, it can run a ton of different OSs. And, you know, it, it's just, it has one fallback is that it's slow and the power consumption is very, very tricky. You gotta have really clean power. It has to be exactly at five volts, otherwise you get what's called a brownout. And the thing just sets and restarts. So that was kind of a drawback. I wanted to be able to beat this thing up so that it will last through any type of testing that we're doing. So what ended up happening is we started to develop on Tahoe. I'm not sure if any of you know what Tahoe is, but I'll go over what it can what it can be done. Um, basically, it's a it's a structure. You know, it's a um, built on. It started back in 1999. It's been around forever. Not a lot of people have heard of it. It um, it uses very re reliable storage solution. So basically, it's a gateway that. Has an, it contains an embedded web server which clients can manipulate the files through a simple RESTful protocol. So it has a RESTful service as well. So I'll, sh I'll go over the front end later, but it also has a RESTful API that you can use to integrate with your application. And one of the things we're working on is to have an actual grid bootable OS. So you plug the BeagleBone, you know, Raspberry Pi, whatever PC you have, and it boots off of grid. That's kind of, you know, the direction I'm trying to go. And our goal is to separate these concerns. So everybody has a concern, and I've talked to some people about their projects. You know, they're concerned where they're going to store their data. They're concerned that, you know, we're, what what they're obligated to give you. So we assume that any storage provider we use, like say we use Dropbox or anybody, we should assume that we're to get nothing from them except for, you know, here's a place to put your files. Good luck. Um, so I guess I could go into it a little bit more. Uh, 
if if I purchase, you know, uh, stores, let's say I, I buy Amazon S3, and I'm, you know, in the cloud, and I have my files out there, and I'm having everybody work, everybody's happy, uh, and I'm, you know, and say they decide to bring their own bodyguard, which they're firewall, basically. I want to build a, a system in which I can still use that. So I want to still be able to use Amazon, and I want to still be able to use Dropbox and any type of Google Drive or whatever, but I want to be my own bodyguard. I want to be able to put my files out there, and I want to secure them how I think they should be done. I don't want them to tell me, you know, oh, we're going to cover your files and candy and Christmas and everything you find, because it's usually not the case. So I want to be in control of that and my data. And so this is what this, this file system is going to do. So we take all of this stuff that you see on the screen and we do a simple collection. And we we have clients. So this is a, the most basic overview of the grid. We have a collection of clients and we have a bunch of storage servers. It doesn't matter what it is. It can be Google. It can be your own personal, you know, drive. You have, may have a bunch of old drives you hook together or whatever. You can set this up in a ton of different ways. The beauty of this. You can even set up friend nets. So everybody that's your friend, you know, provides storage for you. You and this is kind of the idea that I had for the hive is that, you know, we go to all these conferences, these things seem like door prizes. You give them out, you plug them in, everybody's now setting up an internal grid in a huge conference. It would be kind of neat. You could play, you know, you know, capture the hash or whatever. You could do all kinds of things with it because the file structure is really unique. And everything that this thing does is dependent on one thing. Without this one particular thing, it's it's completely useless. And, and you're going to say, oh, well, it's a point of failure. Well, it's not necessarily true. Because once you're introduced, you're introduced. It's like meeting somebody. You know, you meet somebody, you're going to remember them. It's, an inter it's called the introducer, <laughs> oddly enough. But it's a special service that helps nodes connect each other. All nodes connect and introduce are both clients and storage servers. So without this, nobody knows where anybody is or where they come from. Now, what this also does is it allows you to set up a unique um, principle so you can actually go in there and set rules. You can say, okay, Alice, you're going to use this tub of storage. You're going to use this, and you're only going to have access to this stuff. These storage servers are offline. They'll never see that kind of stuff. That's all done behind the scenes. You know, and the cool thing is, it's like, oh, well, now I'm liable, right, because my introducer's out there, and it's on my network, and if somebody knows something they shouldn't be, it's my fault. Well, that's not necessarily true either, because the only person that knows whose data is whose is the person that's uploaded it, because it's, it's encrypted and uploaded. And I'll show that in just a couple of slides. But this, the client, can be configured in numerous ways. Client, plain client doesn't offer up storage, so you'll never see it. So it's completely anonymous. So you, you have a client, which is the front end of Paho running on your computer, your whatever, hooking to your grid or whatever you're hooking it to with your application, with your API calls or whatever. You're going out to your storage. Your storage it has file chunks that are that are sent to there by the client, and it uses an erasure encoding. We'll get into that here in a minute. So we encode and upload. You know, we use erasure encode, eraser, eraser, however you say it. But you have a ton of different shares. We take your file and we split it up. Let's say you had a 10 node hive. And your hive may have a ratio of 3 to 10. So what that means is you only need three of those servers to construct a valid file. So let's say three quarters of your hive gets compromised or you know flooded and catches on fire or whatever. It doesn't matter. The you only need three of them. You only need three of these shares to put it all back together again. And basically, what erasure encoding does is is commonly known as um, forward error correction. It splits the ciphertext into pieces. You know, in such a way that you only need a subset of those pieces to recover the original. The Reed Solomon algorithm is what this is using. It's an implementation, uh, and it's fast and it's really simple. So, what we'll do 
is we'll send this encrypted file to different servers, and thus it'll tolerate failures of a configurable subset of them. So based on how we set up our grid, we can tolerate one-to-one -one failure, which is silly, but you know we can tolerate many-to-one failure. We can tolerate any type of failure that we want to set up. So we're less dependent upon the availability of the individual server. So we don't care if Dropbox goes down. We don't care if they get hacked and, you know, it's the biggest thing on Facebook or whatever. What we do care about is, is our data still there? And if it isn't, fine, but when it comes back, we can still use it. So let's say half of your grid goes offline, right? Half of your shares get corrupted. Big deal. You know, these are going to, those three shares in the middle are bad. And that's fine, and I have a great example to show you exactly how this all works. So all of these other files come in. They only need three. In this case, we have four, and we can construct our data. And if you if you see the link at the bottom, that's the uh, how all this works. It's using a, a separate algorithm called VFEC. And this all goes to the storage. So you look at this storage server and you'll be like, all I see is a bunch of files labeled A through Z. And inside those files you'll have a random file, which is completely unreadable and at the top it says immutable Tahoe equals, and then it'll have a big hash. Using code time is how it's decided upon which which storage server to put these on. So it's completely random. But each one has a unique key that it can put a copy of each one on each storage node. So in order for that to happen, you got to have the key. And only you have the key. Nobody else has the key. I don't have the key. The provider doesn't have the key. Whoever is on your friend net doesn't have the key. Only you do. You lose that key, your, your SOL. You know, you it's very, very unique to you. So once you do that, this is how you will grab the data back from the storage. So you, your key will link it with the storage index. The index will be able to grab the files that you need from whatever shares it finds out there, and it will be able to construct your file back again. So kind of an implementation of this, you know, like in a common storage today would be like Dropbox or something. You know, not a lot of people go out and buy the my books or whatever anymore. But you put your files and you get your files. You have a storage key and then you get your values back from it. So basically what we're going to end up doing is we're going to take the hive. We're going to take our project and we're going to take what we're working on, whether it be OWASP or whatever, and we're going to insert it as a gateway in between these storage nodes. So then we know that we're submitting random storage to Dropbox and this these other you know free storage areas. And this is just one part of what the hive is is in a whole. So we're coupling a, a competent PC that your project is on. You can use it for you know training. You can use it for you know, building your projects, you can use it for workshops, whatever you want to do. But all the while, you have the opportunity to use the grid. You know, and developing right now, we're trying to, we have demos and things and kind of test grids that we're trying to break. But in the long run, you want to be able to have a public grid where people can connect to these or and, you know, can connect and you share data back and forth and give people read-only access to that and there's file caps and write caps and all that kind of stuff I'll show you in the demo. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to show you kind of how the, how this all came about and what the different things look like. But first I want to show you kind of how the encoding works. Hopefully you guys can still see the stream. All right, so let's just say we want to encrypt a line of text. We'll just put ball in here for an example, okay? And what's going to happen is, is as soon as you do this on your client, it's encrypted already. So you're not uploading anything over the wire. Now, 
I'm using, you know, an SSL certificate on my web front end because it is public, but, you know, you'd be silly not to do that anyway. So you encrypt it. It gives you this URL. I don't know if you guys can see this URL. It's very, very small here. But this is kind of just a representation of what the URL will look like. And these are your two keys. You got a key here and you got a key here. This is what's used to retrieve your information. And this ratio here at the end is a three ten three ratio. So we got a no we got a hive of ten you know nodes in it, storage nodes. We need at least three to recover our file. So that's how we're gonna distribute it at across the board. Now let's say you have a huge you know, you have a huge, huge grid, five hundred nodes. You may want to increase that or decrease it. Now, the higher you get in amounts of, of servers that you need, the longer it takes to get your information back. So you will be able to, to see that. Let's see. <clears throat> so now we store it. So once it's stored, this is your node. This is your tense stored node. You can see the um, V6, 4M, you see these weird little uh, encrypted shares, you know, they're to represent hashes. So let's say we want to recover our text. We, hit rec we recover it and it's going gonna, it's gonna to recover using 1, 2, and 3 of the nodes. Now if we corrupt these, let's say they got corrupt somehow. Somebody came in here and hacked our storage. Let's corrupt a whole bunch. The grid is automatically going to recognize that those shares are no longer valid anymore. Using so now it's going to use one four and seven. So you can keep doing this, you can uh, corrupting and you know putting back or whatever. And let's say you got a file and you corrupted your node. It has the capability to repair itself, and it will repair itself over time. So it'll crawl every 12 hours or whatever. And that's a setting you can set up too. So you crawl your grid with an introducer every every day or so, and it will rebuild your your structure. And it does that based on the user's input. So if it knows it has a bunch of unhealthy stuff in it, then when the user grabs their file or goes to the interface, it's going to say it's going to have a little you know, information window that says this file is unhealthy and I'm working on kind of making a better uh, front end for that. So let's, I'll show you what the grid stat, what the grid looks like right now. So this is the front end. This is what it looks like. You got your introducer URL or URI or whatever you want to call it. And this is a unique, basically it's nothing more than a node, but it's acting as an introducer. This is going to tell us what all the storage servers are, where they're located, and their unique file, you know, their node IDs. Um, the helper is something that is very important when you're using a low, you know, a low speed system like a Raspberry Pi, for instance. When you upload a large file, it's very memory intensive. And for, you know, price sakes, you know, those things don't have that much memory. So it's a lot easier to use a helper node, which you can assign each one of these a helper. So if you have friends that are storage nodes, then they can be helpers. And when they get files uploaded to them, it will offload some of the work, kind of like a load balancer, to these other nodes so that they can disseminate that stuff across the board. And you can, the storage servers, you know, something that shows, you know, the total disk space for this node. Now, we might have tons of terabytes everywhere, but unless it, we reserve that space or we give that space to people to use, nobody can use it. Us as clients, we decide what's going to happen. But this specific grid for testing purposes is public, and expiration is enabled, which means that the lease is having a, an expiration time on them. So if nothing ever happens to a lease, say like you get a file and then you lose the key, so now you're and it starts filling up your storage space with random stuff that you lost, and it's in the grid somewhere. You, know, you can go in there and you can wipe all the shares out, and then you know whatever you want to do. But every 31 days or so, it will remove uh, immutable and mutable file, which means it will take those shares and it will delete them. They're gone. Bye bye.
and it will crawl and it will look for the next the next times in that these files were executed. So if it crawls, then it's going to renew your lease automatically. Now this is all this is all you know extra credit type stuff. You don't have to have leases and stuff on your your uh, files. You can just have it store forever, but you'll fill up your your grid pretty quickly. You know, if you have a lot of people using it, people are just uploading random all the time. So, um, with that said, oh, I mean, buckets, buckets are the storage, tubs, buckets, or whatever you want to call them. Um, so this says there's 49 buckets, <laughs> and um, sorry about that, ringing the doorbell. But anyways, what will happen is is each storage node can be assigned different buckets. So you can go in there and assign one storage node 10 different buckets, however you want to do it. And if things get disseminated to the, those buckets, they'll, they'll start to register within the grid itself automatically. So you don't have to worry about, you know, all the complexities. Once this is up, it seems complicated right now, and it's, it's not real concrete, but once this thing is up and running, it's a very... It's very fail safe. Yes, every now and then I get I'll get an error because I'll upload something and you know I'll have a high of unplugged for whatever reason I was working on it. But this is it's very stable once it's up and running. Um, so just as an example, um, I'll show what the directory structures look like and how to what the files look at. So. This is kind of what a directory would look like. You can make these directories in any form you want. You can even set up SFTP files that will automatically upload to the grid so you can have your project files upload automatically every time they're put in there. And every time it crawls, which it does two crawls, it does a lease expiration crawl and it does a just a, a regular system-wide function crawl. And when it does that initial crawl, it'll check those files and it'll upload whatever's in there. So you can set it to run every minute if you want. And kind of there's some kind of cool things I wanted to show off is, you know, you can, you can set up a secure, like, wiki on here. So you can either set it as um, readable or non-readable, and it's using the Tahoe Labs secure file structure. So you can see up there that crazy URL, that is what it's using to generate this page. And if you want to, you can also do a read-only one. So there's two different types of files. There's read-only and readable. And so you got the readable ver or the read-only version here that will allow you just to view the latest um, version of the wiki. There's, when you upload something, let's just do this real quick. Let's pick a file. Let's do this. And right, we're going to upload this JSON file. And we'll make, and there's immutable, there's SDMF and MDMF. MDMF. And the SDMF will allow you to actually change the file. So using the same crawl process, you change the file, it knows what you've done because it separates the, those files into containers. But for this instance, we'll just do an immutable file. And it'll upload to the grid. Right now, the grid that we're working with is a grid of eight beagle bones. And uh, they are um, they are the sole storage for this, and there's a uh, small Atom blade server that I'm using for an introducer just because it was convenient at the time. But here we can check the immutable file structure. So we got our file recap and our verify cap. This is what uses this is the file this, um, verifier that it uses to actually go out to the grid, and it's going to grab your information for you. So it's going to use this when you go get your file back. The API uses this similar type of fashion. If you look up here at the URL, you have obviously the base URL, and then you have the URI, and then 
this is kind of dumb. This is actually a colon, but this is how it's kind of separated up. So you know that that's going to check, which is going to verify, and then it's going to have this, which is the first part of the hash that's going to go out and initiate the connection to the index, storage index. And then the rest of this is going to go through and look for your file using that immutable erasure encoded share and it's going to grab all your stuff and re and re and recompile all that stuff to your actual file. And then so if you have a broke file, which I do on here, I have a bunch of broke ones. Let's say that uh All right, so we want to verify every bit. This is expensive. So if you have a huge file and you want to verify that this file is good, it's really important to you, you run this. This is a great benchmarking tool. It's kind of how I benchmarked how the Hive runs. When we're transmitting a bunch of files, I'll use this every bit to verify. And what will happen is it will go out to the grid and it will verify every single thing that's on every single node that has the share out there that it can put back together to get you a uh, readable file from this. So you got share counts. You need three out of ten. We have six. We need ten. So in order, it, because of this, it's not healthy. And there's no wrong shares in there. So if there's a share that's corrupted, it'll come up here and it'll say that share is wrong. And all this stuff is, you know, statistics type of junk. You can have an actual node be nothing more than a statistics node and all it does is stuff like this. You know, so you don't have to worry about, you know, people bogging down your node or your your grid getting bogged down. You can actually have a standalone node that does nothing but statistics and actually you can have another node on top of that one that just generates hashes and keys. So anyways what we'll do is okay, so we know that this is now an un, this is not a healthy share. So you can go in here and you can repair it. You can repair it. So what it'll do, it'll go out there, it'll grab the file that it knows because it's able to do it. If you can't get enough shares to, you know, reconstruct your information, you can't repair it, obviously. So what it's going to do, it's going to redistribute that lease back out of the grid. And you'll see this happen. So now it's healthy. The repair was successful. And now it's um, checking. It'll do a run a check real quick. And now we know that we have a share on every single node here. And that's the share IDs. So with that being said, that's basically kind of a high level um, explanation of how this whole thing will work. Um, the idea behind all this is to provide something useful to the OWASP community, basically anybody that's working with this. You can use this technology to do a ton of different type of, uh, oh, I have a question. Yeah, yeah, you can use this to um to do different different kinds of shares. You can have each chapter could have their own grid if they wanted to. So you can set up a public grid. Let's say OWASP decides, oh hey, I want to set up a public grid for OWASP. Then you can have that introducer act as in a um, public grid for everything. And people just connect to it and use it. And the share buckets can either come from your chapter, your area, your own private stash, whatever you want it to do. So you, the possibilities are basically endless. And that was kind of the idea behind this was to have something at OAuth to be able to secure data and overall be able to provide something that's shareable and tangible to the community. The whole um, the whole aspect of this is very, very cumbersome. Like when I first started, this thing failed. Things didn't work right. 
you know, loading it on a Raspberry Pi. You know, it's easy, it, everybody's like, oh, we just go out and buy a computer. You know, like everybody's got 900 bucks to spend on a server or whatever. So the next best thing is to find something very cheap, very simple. And, you know, this could even be something that you could stick onto a badge. You know, you can, my next project is to get this thing to run, like, as a root boot. So you can boot this thing up and things will happen, whatever, whatever is anybody's mind to do. And this project's open for people to come in and help and, you know, play with a hive. I would like to build another hive. I am using the Get Stuff Done project funds to build this one that you're looking at right now. But it would be ideal to have a few more hives and be able to connect them together and interface with them and, you know, possibly explore, you know, some other avenues of approaches to have multiple introducers and be able to restrict introducers to certain people. I mean, there's just all kinds of stuff that can be done here. And a cool, one of the really cool things about this is it's just say you're in a classroom environment. Everybody has a computer of sorts and whatever their deal is. And let's say you have a hive there. Well, everybody can now experiment with the hive and you can store your information within the grid, whether that be, you know, log files, whether it be whatever the case is, but you can collaborate on a whole different level. So you're able to use cheap PCs, which you can, you know, hack them, break them, do whatever you want with them. You don't have to worry about jacking up your own PC or whatever. Then you can actually inter in incorporate this into a learning environment, which is what this is all about. It's, it's to learn things, and this technology is always being developed on. Least authority developed this technology. I'm just kind of taking it to a whole different realm, you know, and trying to get it out there so it's like, hey, look what this can do. And the cool thing about it is, is I already have, and I think it's, there's one on here. I may have taken it down, but I use Dropbox as a storage node. No, I took it off. But I use Dropbox as a storage node just for proof of concept. So I use their free public storage as my own storage and I don't and I don't really care if anybody gets the files because there's not much they can do with them. They need three more servers to get or whatever my ratio is to get my data. And that is pretty pretty cool to me. I mean that that gives you a peace of mind that also gives you kind of a a sense of ownership. I mean, yeah, you can take my data or it also it relieves you of any type of liability. Like me, I'm a I you know host websites and things, but if I'm going to give somebody files and I'm going to store them and I can see them, I'm I'm part liable because I know what's in there. But if I have this storage node and I'm going to show you exactly what it looks like, if I see like you know we have five minutes left, so hopefully I can get this done. If I can see what their files are, I'm liable. But if I don't know what they're doing, you know, big deal. They can do it all day long. Oops. Let's see here. And one other thing that I'll go over to is I wanted the ability to put this online and I wanted the ability to secure it because I thought, well, I don't want just random people uploading to my grid. I know it's public and everything else and the one that's out there is right now, but if I was to do this for real and have, you know, something public that I only wanted so many people to have access to, I wanted the ability to lock it down. So I used Authy, like a one time token approach. So you have to have a one time token and it has to be set up on an account which I was using um WordPress to do that. So you get your token, put that in there, and then you get access to the grid. So you can kind of control who's getting into your grid at a higher type enterprise level versus, you know, hey, everybody just start uploading because, as you know, people exploit that and all kinds of bad stuff will happen. So this is what the files would look like.
So this is what the shares would look like. So down Dropbox and stuff, it will copy these folders out to their area. And this is all that's there. This incoming folder will actually have the incoming hash. And then what will happen is, is your client will actually destroy that file into these different shares. So here's one. We'll view this. And what happens is, is once your file is in here, it's it's, it's uh, erasure encoded. So I mean, it's very, <laughs> as you can see, I mean, it's not tangible. I'm sure, like, if you're the NSA and you have tons of time on your hands and eighteen thousand billion dollars of taxpayers' money to throw at this, I would really be surprised if they could actually get a file to even show remotely what you're looking for, especially if you had a ratio of like five to thirty or something. Thirty shares, you need at least five and they only had say they had say they had two minutes. You know, they might get something. I don't know. I'd, it'd be interesting to have somebody actually have the skill to be able to decrypt something like this to see if it can even be broke. But at any rate, at the very bottom of this file, with all the null mess in here, you can see the segments, the segment sizes, the share root hashes, and stuff like that, and what it needs to decode this. But without the actual key, it's useless. So that I would like. To, I wasn't going to go over the sandbox, but I'm kind of running out of time, and I'm still kind of working on it. I can, if you're really con concerned about, you know, seeing what I'm, what's going on with the hive, netgreen.us is the touch bounds for this. Anybody is more than welcome to go out there, take a look. It has the quick start guide for the BeagleBone Black. It has the um, downloaded. Um, uh, OS that I'm using. It's nothing but a stripped down copy DB and Weezy. It goes in how to install Python, how to install all the dependencies, and how to build this thing. You can even fork my GitHub if you want. And you can also fork Tahoe Labs, and you can start experimenting on your own, building your own Tahoe Labs storage solution. And I mean, it's, it's, it's as simple as this command right here that says create node slash welcome to the grid. You're creating a node, and that's what your node name is. And this is what this whole presentation is, is welcoming you to the grid because this is I'm hoping that when I start this that you guys' eyes and stuff are like, wow, we could really do something cool with this. So I'm hoping that you feel motivated and you want to do more with this because it's going to be kind of a game changer, kind of a project changer for, for OWASP, I think. And go forth and conquer. <laughs> that is all I have. And I thank you for the people that are on. I'm not even sure if anybody is on, but I did have some questions. So there's at least one person that's me. Yep. Thanks, Jason. That's um that's interesting. I see that there's uh a lot of potential practical applications for this, so that's great. Um and how do people get in touch with you? Um I'm on um let's see here. I'm sorry. I'm actually I'm on a on a Twitter as uh, I am Jason Johnson, and also you can get a hold of me at Jason.Johnson at OWASP.org, and if anybody wants to write that down, there's also um, the Tahoe De Dev IRC channels. I don't know if anybody ever goes in those, but I'm in there. 24 hours a day. So if you're in the Tahoe Dev channel, I'm usually in there trying to accomplish something, but that is my Twitter handle. There's also OWASP OKC on Twitter too. And if you go to netgreen.us, you just hit the contact page and hit me up and mm -hmm. I'll try to answer everything I can. Great. And if all of all else fails, you are the uh Oklahoma City chapter leader, so you can yeah. always connect to you through the Oklahoma City chapter. So that's awesome, Jason. Um, if there are no more questions, then um, I think that's our presentation for the day. And I hope you have found this as interesting as I have. And um, we'll 
certainly be reaching out to Jason for some more information on this project. So thank you all for joining, and thanks, Jason. You're welcome. Bye.